Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second class in this special course, this special seminar, comparing and contrasting Dutch and American cultures, really, and approaches to dealing with water, the problem of water. Um, in the first class, we got had two talks. Uh, in the first of those two talks, uh, I gave a attempted to give a historical overview of these cultures and how they developed, how the Dutch culture developed around the problem of water. And um, in the second talk, Hank Ovink, the uh, Dutch uh, water envoy to the UN, uh, took us around the world. And he talked about both the problem of too much water and too little water. Uh, he talked about how, how difficult this problem is, how difficult uh, and varied the problem of collaboration is. But uh, I think his main point was there's really no other choice. Um, in the papers, the reflections that the students in my Wake Forest class uh, sent, uh, there seemed to be a common theme of skepticism over whether a collaborative approach can work in the US. And people were particularly focused on uh, the federal level, how uh, several people remarked that they thought uh, collaboration can work regionally, but that given the divisiveness of politics, they can't see it working so well at the federal level, which is uh, a, an interesting perspective, probably a, a lot of wisdom in it. At the same time, one of the things I think we'll hear from today is that the um, the effort in the New York region, the Rebuild by Design, which uh, was spearheaded by Hank Obink, um, was uh, started by federal uh, involvement. Um, so that that raises a number of interesting questions and, and possibilities. Um, I want to give a heads up to both the um, Wake Forest students and the Groningen students that uh, <clears throat> we will that Terry and I are expecting each of you to pose a question to our two speakers at the end. Uh, we've got two speakers upcoming, but first, Terry, did you um, have some remarks you wanted to give? Yeah, so uh, what we lo uh, saw, saw last week was this comparison of cultures, and it showed very nicely how deeply rooted this is. Uh, and yes, as said just now as well, the, um, the culture and the necessity of collaboration is such a cultural institutional thing that um, dealing with water isn't about uh, technicalities. It's not about calculations. It's not about concrete or steel, uh, but it is about um, finding each other and awareness and reaching out to each other. And as Hank Hoving said last uh, last week, uh, commitment. But this commitment and working together has to be informed also in a technical way. So the uniqueness of it is to bring together all these different disciplines and all these different subcultures within organizations, within governments, within countries to uh, combine forces and uh, do a good job. So it's very much physical, institutional at the same time, which needs collaboration between the two and which needs people, as we will see today, which needs people who, uh, who are sensitive to both. And that's also a challenge for the students of the future, the professionals of the future, understanding physics, understanding the landscape in a physical sense, but also understanding the institutional landscape that will make something possible or not. And this case is an, a great demonstration of that. So I'm looking forward to the insight the speakers of today will give us on this. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker. Amy Chester is the managing director of the aforementioned Rebuild by Design, where she leads an international design-driven competition, bringing together 10 design teams consisting of more than 200 individuals and more than 700 government agencies and community organizations who created proposals that utilized an inclusive and collaborative process to create implementable, large-scale infrastructure projects to address the physical and social vulnerabilities exposed by Hurricane Sandy uh, in the Northeast United States. Rebuild by Design 
now works with cities around the world to use the same collaborative process to address issues of climate change. Amy Chester, the floor is yours. I think you have to unmute. Here we go, sorry about there that. Um, I'm just gonna have lots of technical problems dealing with my audio today, apparently. Um, but thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. Super excited to hear from Edgar, um, what he's gonna talk about. Edgar and I have been working together for years, but it's so rare that you get to actually hear your colleagues reflect on, on the work that you've done together and the work that you've done apart. Um, so I'm Amy Chester, and yes, I, I did lead Rebuild by Design as the project manager. Um, that was eight years ago. I actually started out my career as a political and community organizer. So I don't have a technical background in architecture or urban planning or landscape architecture. However, majority, if not all of the people that I work with um, do have that background now. My background is in community organizing, and then I worked into, I went into government for over 10 years working in the legislative branch um, in the elector I'm sorry in the executive branch and for a city agency in New York City and I've done a, a bunch of other stuff kind of in between so I think what you'll see is that our approach to rebuild by design really comes from that collaboration which of course has that influenced um, through Hank and, and the Dutch examples but also through Hank and the Rockefeller Foundation and HUD deciding to to hire me to do the job um, because I didn't have that type of technical background that you would probably think um, would be the person that they would select. Um, so that's that in itself, I think is kind of interesting. And of course, what, what's happened with Rebuild by Design is a reflection of me as much as it's a reflection of, um, the, you know, with the ecosystem that we're working in right now, which is about trying to get things done through politics. So Rebuild by Design um, does three things or three buckets. The first is large scale regional design competitions. And that's what you heard about last week. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about it as well. The second is innovative processes to address city's challenges. And I'm gonna go into to the examples there. And the third is research and policy. And we've actually turned to do a bit more in the research and policy lately um, as there's a lot more need for really kind of like thought leadership in this space, trying to figure out how we as a society are going to approach these problems. So, I mean, you guys know this better than we do. I feel like students are so much ahead of the curve comparatively, but um, climate change is here. Last year, we had a record $22 billion disasters in the US. It's not getting any easier. Here are some of the significant climate anomalies. This is um, put out by our federal government from NOAA. They do this every single year when they talk about the things that are anomaly, but really they do it every single month too. Um, so it's, it, it's kind of funny that they keep using this word, which means that it's that it deviates from what's standard or normal. But actually climate change has become our new normal and we need to th start thinking like that and accept it. Because this is how it's leaving our communities. These are images from Hurricane Sandy, but they could have been images from um, Hurricane Ida in New Orleans. They could have been images from Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Um, these are becoming our new normal. And what it shows us is the interconnection between physical resilience and social resilience. And you really can't solve for one without the other. And I don't know how much you've gone into social resilience. Maybe you haven't yet. Um, but social resilience um, really started out with Eric Kleinenberg, um, who runs the, the institute that we are housed in at NYU. Um, and he wrote this book about the 1995 Chicago heat wave. And it's super interesting, although it's very technical. And there's a chapter of it in Palaces for the People. So that's kind of like the shortcut to get to the story. But essentially what he did is he looked at the 1995 Chicago heat wave where 700 people were killed in one week. Now think about that. 700 people, 700 community members, 700 of people's neighbors were killed in one week because the government was completely not prepared for it and was covering up their unpreparedness instead of admitting it and trying to come up with solutions. But the interesting piece of his research is that he looked at two 
um, neighborhoods, both low income, both had high crime crime rates, both were um, African American neighborhoods. Um, however, one had a hundred less deaths than the other one, and he wanted to understand why that was. And what he did is he, what his studies revealed was that when communities understand each other, know each other, live in close proximity to each other, they check on each other and they're there for each other. And when people are um, living in areas that are further apart, in this case, there's a lot of abandoned buildings in Chicago and the other neighborhood, the neighbors don't know each other. Uh, heat is the number one cause of death for um, number one climate cause of death in the US. And it is um, the worst place you can be in a heat wave is inside your own home because it's actually hotter inside your own home if you don't have air conditioning. So while many elderly people tend to stay inside their home, as government says, don't go outside. We have a heat wave. But actually, you, the only reason why you should be in your home is if you have access to cooling devices. Um, Palaces for the People is an excellent book that he put out uh, I think maybe a year or two ago, I have COVID brain of, of time, um, but I really uh, suggest that you read it because it talks about all the different other institutions that we have, like libraries that are able to contribute to social resilience. So social vulnerability, who are the people who are most affected by climate disasters? They tend to be the ones that are young or old, that they can't, you know, they, they, they can't, um, help themselves, they really need to trust other people. They may not evacuate, they may not trust um, the person that's knocking on their door. And that would usually leads to increased isolation and then additional mistrust and health issues, and in some cases, death. Then there's environmental vulnerability. And the people that are the most um, uh, that live in environmental justice neighborhoods are the ones that tend to also be environmentally, um, those that tend to be most vulnerable during uh, climate moments um, because they already are, have exposure to noxious infrastructure such as power plants or waste transfer stations. And then when a storm comes, um, that infrastructure is no longer stable. So you can imagine what happens if there's an oil spill during a storm and then all of the flood water picks up, or um, I don't know if there's a lot of international um, uh, students here. I was thinking about when I was in India uh, many years ago when there was a very big storm and, and India has a lot, they don't have sewer systems. So what happened was all of the dirt from the, from the roads and all of the human waste um, was actually lifted with the flood waters. And then of course you have issues where it touches your skin um, and things are always worse. And then last of which is economic vulnerability. And those are people who have too little savings or too low credit scores where after a disaster, they're not able to bounce back quick enough. Um, and in the United States, our federal emergency management uh, administer administration, which is FEMA, um, has released statistics that if a business is not open by the fourth day after a disaster, 90% of them will fail within one year. And that's an alarming number. And it wasn't specific to a climate disaster. It just said after, after a disaster. So if you think about all the businesses that shut during COVID before the government was able to put together their PPEs and their um, different loans, um, those businesses were on the brink of being a, of failing for our entire country. Of course, that'll be exasperated in other countries too. Um, communities that are that are hit by a medium-sized disaster leads a five percent. Um, increase in collections after one year, and that doubles after four years. So it's not just about the moments after disaster. It actually keeps on um, exasperating the situation that you're in at that moment. And that people living in communities of color hit by medium-sized disasters have an average of a 31-point decline in credit score comparatively to a four-point decline in majority white communities. And there was even a study that came out um, after this, which talked about in some white communities, there's a New York Times article about it. In some white communities, people actually thrive after a disaster because they're able to get loans and build back and build back in better ways that make their housing um, even more profitable. So you know where we are. We have urban population that is increasing at the same time that storm intensity um, is is rising at the same time that our temperature is rising. And then of course there's sea level rise. And this is really kind of the silent, um, 
the, the silent, uh, you know, to be killer, but the silent wave that's coming at us right now, which is um, how are we going to prepare ourselves for in New York City, for instance, three to six feet of sea level rise. So this is um, the current 500 year floodplain for New York City and 50 percent of the city that I grew up in is at risk. Just to kind of I don't think we have a pointer here, but just to kind of show you that middle area, um, that's Manhattan. Manhattan's kind of just a tiny slice of New York City. On the right side of your green screen is Brooklyn and Queens. And on the bottom of your screen is Staten Island. The left side is New Jersey. So we are 520 miles of waterfront in our city and 50% of our city is at risk. And the cost of these disasters continue to go up. So it's not just um, that it is a physical risk, there's also a financial risk to having instability into our economy. However, we also know that being prepared pays off. One dollar of spending for um, flood risk or investment into flood risk pays off six dollars in future benefits. And that's because of the flood protection itself, it's because of public health, it's because of property value, cleaner water, carbon sequestration, so there's really an economic argument for doing it earlier, um, for, for investing in what we call resilient infrastructure. However, like our government and our agencies and our governance system has not yet caught up to this. We also have to decide um, how we are going to respond. So once we get to respond, we need to think about, OK, what are the interventions that we are going to create? And this is the intervention that the Japanese government um, has built after their tsunami. And this to me is not what I would like to see in my hometown. Um, this is a flood wall. It's a very great infrastructure solution. It divides fishermen from their jobs. It divides communities from their waterfront. And it doesn't take up that much space. You know, the footprint is, is pretty narrow. And maybe we could ask Edgar if it would fit in New York. It probably would fit in New York, but it would be pretty horrible to live next to that. So we have to make these decisions about where we want to allow nature to come in um, and where we don't. This is just a, um, an image thinking about what it might be like if we flipped New York City and all the areas that were gray turned green. Um, and this is an image from my friend um, Jennifer's Instagram. This is five years after Hurricane Sandy. So one of my closest friends from high school, her, she lived in Staten Island in one of the areas that were hardest hit by Hurricane Sandy. Her neighbor's house slid off the foundation, slid into her house, and her house slid away with her husband and her husband's friend in it. She was with my other friend at the time and their children. Her husband had um, you know, some broken bones, um, but was mostly OK. Um, however, you can see, and this is an area that actually was able to petition our government for buyouts and get, have buyouts, you can see that five years after the storm, nature came back and took what was there before. So a lot of the problems that we have come from us building building on top of nature. This is um, another one of my favorite uh, communities. It's actually where I happen to be right now. This is an ocean park in, in Puerto Rico. This is on the left-hand side. It's before Hurricane Maria. On the right-hand side, it's after Hurricane Maria. And this is what it looks like again. Because we as humans keep putting back exactly what was there before and try to pretend that everything's OK and that the answers that worked for before are going to help us in the future. But obviously, they're not working. So we have to figure out how are we going to adapt and what does adaptation look like to us? So we can take our cue from other places. Um, Venice has been dealing with floodwaters for 100 years now. And this is how they were thinking about adaptation for quite a long time, kind of ignoring the fact that they have this problem. They kind of made it fun. They put down these walkways and give tourists these ridiculous color boots so they can you know, pretend that there's nothing wrong and snap pictures and put it on Instagram. However, people live here and people have businesses here and no one should have to walk through all of this trash um, and all of this dirt um, to try and just sustain their every way of life. So we have these choices about whether or not we want to adapt using green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And these were um, kind of questions that became um, pretty relevant right after Hurricane Sandy. So Hurricane Sandy came and about maybe eight, 
10 months later, Rebuild by Design was launched as an initiative of HUD um, as our federal government and happy to talk about some of the issues that were raised at the beginning of this class, talking about the federal government. Um, and Rebuild by Design is, a we call ourselves a process, but we're also an organization that brings together global and local expertise and regional leadership. So taking the best minds of the world, connecting them to communities on the ground and local governments that really understand what they need the most and to tackle multidimensional problems that harness and cultivate strong stakeholder support and government leadership. And I'll talk about what this means in a moment. So as we mentioned before, we got our beginning from Hurricane Sandy. And the reason why we were launched is because Hurricane Sandy was the, really the first time that our government admitted that it didn't have the answers. Before Hurricane Sandy, there was Hurricane Katrina a couple of years before. It was the first time that the U.S. had been you know, kind of smacked in the face with such a deadly storm. And everyone thought that was a once in a hundred years or once in a lifetime storm. And when Hurricane Sandy came, it did feel like there was a bit of a shift to understanding that this is going to happen more often. Of course, since the hurricanes came afterwards, uh, many, many more, we understand that this is our new normal. But what usually happens in a design process is you know what you want to build in the end and you back your way into it. So a typical design process, let's say it's for a hospital or a school, you know what the square footage is you know the location and you kind of back your way into saying, okay, well, how many beds do we need to have? How many classrooms do we need to have? What's the budget that we're working under? And you kind of fit it in an envelope. But that wasn't going to work after Hurricane Sandy because we needed to really take a moment to think about what, what happens when we don't know the answers? How do we build for an uncertain future? So we created um, a design detour, and maybe you've seen this slide from Hank. I'm not sure which slides he's been, he's been using lately. Um, but the idea was to create this iterative process that allows us to test things and ask questions and then design and ask more questions and come back in the loop. And one of the kind of big transformational things, at least in how I see it in the US government at this moment was really pushing for multi-purpose infrastructure. No longer would we want to create, you know, just a flood wall. How do we create infrastructure that creates benefits for communities every single day, not just those on on climate emergencies. So there's lots of examples of uh, multi-benefit infrastructure. Um, this is a project from the Bjorka Ingalls Group. It's a waste to energy power plant and also a ski slope that's in um, Copenhagen. Here's another one that's offices in a hotel um, that create energy. Another is a parking garage in the Netherlands. You can see that there's um, houses to the right of the screen, or maybe it's flipped, but houses inland and water is upland and the berm itself is a parking garage. So trying to think about how do you create something that you can use every day that also creates this extra purpose. And I'm sure you've seen lots of these. I feel like every um, city is talking about creating water squares with, again, inspiration from the Netherlands, thinking about how can you create these play stages and communities that are playgrounds and days that are dry, water squares with a little bit of rain, then can have the ability to hold a lot of rain storage and then can be creative, like creating an ice skating rink in the wintertime. So the first thing that Rebuild by, by Design did was um, create and launch um, with the government the, the Hurricane Sandy Design Competition. I won't go into too many details because I know that Hank talked about this quite extensively last week. But essentially what happened was there was a call out for interdisciplinary design teams that were led by designers and led by a U.S. firm that would look at New York, New Jersey and Connecticut. So the areas that were hardest hit during Hurricane Sandy would use federal disaster funds to think about how to leverage to build forward instead of building back. And this was the big innovation at the time, because before this moment, 100 percent of federal disaster recovery funds had to be used to build back exactly what was there before, regardless if that what was there before didn't really work. Um, and this is a key moment of, of the innovation for Rebuild by Design. We had some really incredible lawyers that were based in government that figured out how to do it under the America Competes Act. And this was about focusing on the future, not returning to the past, that the infrastructure had to address multiple goals at the same time. So no longer could the Department of Transportation just create infrastructure that's about the transportation or the Department of Water about water. 
And the teams and the projects would be judged on innovation. So it could not be something that government would have designed on their own. Collaboration with government and stakeholders and implementation. And this is key to rebuild by design is that everything has to be implementable. And that's a kind of funny word. Um, but in our case, we wanted to make sure that um, the policies were any, were were in place and the budgets that were allocated could start off those um, designs. So these designs were really big ideas. We knew we weren't going to be able to implement them all with the dollars that we had just from disaster recovery, but we want to be able to show, you know, kind of proof of concept with the first phase of the projects. Um, as you mentioned before, uh, Rebuild by Design was just a really enormous effort. And as I mentioned, I worked in a lot of different collaborations um, previously in government, always on the kind of edge of community and government trying to work together and me always trying to get them to work together either on the community side or the government side. But this is by far the largest that I've ever seen anywhere um, and by far the most successful in terms of the collaboration. So this is an enormous amount of, um, of it was enormous effort for eight or nine months of work. We started out with four partner NGOs and five philanthropic funders, and we ended up working with 141 different neighborhoods, 19 universities, 535 community stakeholder organizations, and over 180 government agencies. And of course, this is enormous, um, an enormous numbers, but if you divide them each by 10, you can get a sense approximately of what each of the design teams did in their, you know, with their approach. And then you can see how these numbers kind of come to life and become a little bit more manageable. And why do we do that? Um, I think this is one of the most important pieces and would love when we talk about the Kimmelman piece to come back to this um, is because when you do that, you are educating community members, you are educating the people who are in government, even after the executive levels of government change. Um, and they are the ones that will support the projects for the next generation. We cannot just sprinkle on the beginnings of a project and walk away. We needed to make sure that there was someone that was going to hang, you know, hold the torch for us afterwards. So these are the uh, seven projects that received funding. I'm not going into any of them because I think Hank did it last week, but essentially they go from um, funding was allocated from $335 million um, for the Big U, which is uh, behind Edgar's uh, um, screen right now, if you want to see what it looks like. Um, and the smallest was in Connecticut, $10 million. Um, however, both Connecticut and the Big U and other projects were able to leverage more money in the following year with the National Disaster Resilience Competition that happened as um, inspired by Rebuild by Design with another billion dollars of disaster recovery money the following year. This is an outdated um, slide that shows the implementation process. Um, most of our, well, I would say half of our projects were, were broke ground last year and the rest will break ground this year. However, I still use a slide because it shows all the different steps that each of the projects have to take. So once these ideas were awarded funding, there's a, you know, huge amount of work that happens when government steps in to take them over and then continues to refine the ideas, do the environmental assessments, do the engineering assessments, and try to now make them realities. So as I mentioned before, we started out with 930 million dollars among the seven projects. And we now have over to, I think it's actually up to now, 2.6 billion dollars invested in these projects today. And I think this is a really important piece because what I think it demonstrates is that when you have a good idea, you attract money. So you might not have the best, you know, all the money up front, but if you can show that people are, um, that people want the project, that stakeholders will advocate for the project, that this is a project that's going to work, it attracts investment. Um, so since then, we have now taken that same um, kind of collaborative uh, approach, and we've worked in over a dozen cities. Uh, we're working right now in the city of Singapore, in Boulder, finishing up a project in Puerto Rico. And with all of our engagements, we keep the same kind of tenets of what made Rebuild by Design so special. This actually came from a report that the Urban Institute did about um, the Rebuild by Design competition and try to uncover what 
what, what, what was the special sauce? You know, what made this so different than other government led processes? The first being that it's interdisciplinary, um, that we had architects that were working with engineers, that were working with community specialists, that were working with community members to uncover um, and really design together what the intervention should be. We took a regional approach. So it was definitely the first time in my history of working in New York City government where New York and, and New Jersey are even in the same room. It just doesn't happen. We um, really pushed for an eye towards um, uh, replicable projects that could be replicated in the same region or in others, because we wouldn't be able to create something for every piece of the, in the affected region, but wanted to make sure that our investment's gonna go further. It's implementable, as I mentioned before. It's inclusive. We had a big table and we invited everyone to come. Um, this wasn't something that was done before, behind closed doors. It was extremely collaborative. And most of all, it was comprehensive. It wasn't just for flood infrastructure. It was really thinking about how are we creating community infrastructure Structure in these neighborhoods that address flooding. So essentially what, what the process was were these stages, a call for talent, uh, a collaborative research stage, which Hank probably mentioned to you uh, last week, a collaborative design stage, and then the implementation stage, which we are still in eight years later. So how would we apply this for a smaller site? Um, not sure if anybody knows or will recognize the city. It's a city of Juarez in Mexico. And we worked with 100 resilient cities, the cities of Juarez, um, the Jean Gell Institute and others to rethink a um, public space that was um, very underutilized in the middle of the city that had a lot of resilience challenges. So we worked with um, a number of different organizations to apply that same type of approach. What would a research stage look like? What would a design stage look like afterwards? And in this case, we chose to go and do a competition. Um, but first we worked with university students who went out, who went out and um, observed how the plaza was being used and created also a survey to take the businesses um, to first see how it's being used today. Then from that information, we issued a design brief. This was a very um, low budget project. So we decided to um, aim the design brief to young professionals and students who might wanna get more involved in it. And we created kind of a, a multi-stage process. We had a jury and decided that the top three designs would move on to a public engagement process where we created a community feedback session where the top three um, designers were able to present their designs to the communities and get feedback at it. Um, and this was held at a museum. And then ultimately uh, the winner was chosen by the jury. This is another one of our projects. I would think of it as kind of like a medium site. Um, it is a very, very large site. If you're in the city of Athens, this is Lee Capetus Hill, but it's not a regional site like Rebuild by Design was before. And the challenge was to develop an open and transparent planning process um, for Lake Quebecus Hill, um, which has a lot of ecological um, damages. And what would happen is um, after many months of drought in the city of Athens, they would get really heavy storms and the storms, um, the water could not be absorbed by the, the, the dirt um, and the um, grass on Lake Betis Hill. So it would create these kind of slides and um, the area that was just adjacent to the hill happened to be the, uh, I would say, highest income area in Kolonaki in the city of Athens. And those people would get, um, they'd be flooded quite often. It was kind of like the cyclical floods that would happen. So we worked with the city of Athens. We worked with um, many different um, uh, many different strategic partners on kind of both sides of, of, of the ocean. So we worked with the National Technical University of Athens, but we also brought in the New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, a group that we worked with, um, with Rebuild by Design and Interborough Partners and 100 Resilient Cities. And our research was to have the technical universities conduct studies 
and Rebuild would approach different stakeholders and really try to understand how people are using the Hill and what they think the biggest problems are and what the big opportunity is. And then designing by testing um, different design interventions um, through workshops and, and engagement events. And then the implementation was that the city had $2 million to implement a number of projects. So we first um, analyzed different types of stakeholders and started reaching out in kind of a circle. So first with the municipal and NGO leaders and then going to issue-based focus groups until we finally went to the public. Um, we started off by um, aligning all the different uh, mostly government stakeholders, but not exclusively government stakeholders, but anyone that had a big say. Um, so all the different departments in the city and number of national departments as well. Um, key stakeholders like the tourism board, um, key advocates. And we created a kind of essentially a mission. We, we wanted to start extremely simple and thought about what if we just had to write a mission statement together? Would it be possible that we can get everybody on the same page? And then we followed it up with five thematic meetings and one-on-one -on -one, um, meetings with really key people and then looping back with a big workshop. This is the finish, the finish, sorry, the visioning workshop that we did with 40 municipal and NGO leaders. And this is the statement that we walked out of there with uh, that, that day. Lake Abetis 2030 will be a landmark reference point and a model of exemplar environmental, cultural, financial management, and social participation. Nobody thought that we would get every stakeholder to agree, all the big stakeholders to agree, but we realized that when you really work for collaboration, it happens. Then we moved on to the thematic uh, meetings, as I mentioned to you. So these were issue-based meetings that we held at City Hall with um, experts in culture, economic development, tourism, the civil society to drill down on specific areas and themes. And then we went out to the public. Uh, we created a survey that was distributed um, in, in many ways. And we asked you know, really simple questions about what features do you like most in the Hill? And we got great feedback about that. Um, where are your favorite spots? Where are the important amenities that you would want to see? And then we created an engagement station that we took around the city. So this is actually um, students at, at NJIT created this um, model, 3D model out of cardboard. And we created a station that was so simple that was essentially telling us, show us what felt the places you like, the places you don't like, and the things that you want to expand. And then we actually mapped it. So every time a person did that on the street, we took a photo of it and then mapped all of the information so we can understand exactly what the feedback was. Here's some of the ideas that we heard. Um, and essentially, we then made it into a list and categorized it. And then in addition to that, we created this game called Lake Abetus Mix, which we also um, took out and took to kids and took to all different types of people um, and, and many different types of events. And it's very simple. Essentially, it's a game board. Um, there are 10 slots in it. And we asked each individual person to tell us if you had 10% for each slot, what would be your ideal makeup? of Lake Abetis Hill? What would be the percentage of active recreation versus passive recreation versus um, you know, food establishments that could bring in money versus you know, nature? And everybody created their, their own mix to it. So we did it kind of you know, where everybody's working together and something like this using these um, really cool plastic cutouts that um, each had a different uh, type of activity. And we took it all around Athens with a pop-up station working with local uh, university students. And then we also enabled um, to do it in community meetings, just using different colors and pieces of paper so everybody can do it themselves and drop it off at the end of the day. And most people chose their own activity. And then lastly, we activated the site by going to the site, creating workshops on the site and showing people how it could be used. Um, we created a love leak about this festival. The outcome was that we had 1,500 responses to our survey. We worked with over 50 organizations, um, but essentially we got everybody aligned to what could happen next. And we did a big um, full day conference with the mayor uh, talking about the next steps as the culmination of this effort. Lastly, I'll show you how uh, the rebuild approach can work on a policy issue. This is the city of LA. 
And the city of LA has a really incredible resilience strategy and a really incredible sustainability strategy. However, they realize that their um, same government makes it really hard to build net zero energy buildings and buildings that are considered climate forward. So we created this challenge to refresh and futurize the city's buildings, um, and we called it Building Forward LA. And we worked with a number of different um, really key institutional partners, the local AIA, so the architects, the local green building chapter, the um, Museum of Architecture and Design, UCLA, and the Engineers Association, working directly with the mayor's office. And we created six in industry focused events um, to be our research stage. We held them at the museum and brought other, we invited you know, hundreds of organizations together to come. About 200 organizations participated in those six events. And what was really interesting is standing there at the entrance point as people were coming in for the very first event, everyone was thanking us for putting it together. Thank you so much. We've never been at an event with engineers. Thank you so much. We never have you know, this opportunity to work together, um, which is totally surprising. But when you think about it it, 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 it is unfortunate, but everyone works within their discipline and they're really not thinking about um, kind of taking those barriers down. So here's some images from the event. Essentially, we ended with nine recommendations and a pilot project. Lastly, I just want to show you an example of the research that we've done recently, as I mentioned before, that we're getting more and more into thinking about research. This is New York State. Um, this is flooding that has happened in New York State all within the past 10 years. Everybody thinks of New York City as the area that is most at risk in New York State, but it's actually a huge issue. And when we realized this in our office and we asked around and we realized that nobody at all, none of the environmental groups, none of the infrastructure groups in New York State were working on resilience, we kind of stepped in and we actually mapped the information um, that we were gathering and realized that every single county in New York State had had disaster declarations within the time that the, our government, at the time, our governor held office. And 60% of those counties had more than five. And, you know, as I mentioned before, my background's really in political strategy. So looking at this map and realizing that it's an upstate issue, it's a downstate issue, it's a Democrat issue, it's a Republican issue, I knew that we had the ability to put together a policy that we could create the stakeholder leadership that we would need to to get it passed. Um, so we did. Um, and uh, we, as I mentioned before, we did uh, the research that led us there. We were able to calculate that New York and the federal government have already spent $37.3 billion on disasters within that 10-year period. And studies show that it that the money that a government spends on disasters only covers about one third of the actual cost and how much that is predicted to go up in the next decade. So we proposed the idea of creating a resilient infrastructure fund. Um, we actually asked for $10 billion um, and suggested a way to pay for it. And we created an advisory group, which was, um, you know, a lot of groups that aren't necessarily ever working together. So we put together labor and the environment um, and different key associations that we knew had power with our governor and essentially started forming those um, public private partnerships. We set up those regional partnerships, looked at cost benefit analysis and um, proposed a way forward. We did an economic study to be able to show how many jobs that could be created. Um, this was before COVID, but became even more important during COVID. Um, and ultimately, our governor um, in 2020 announced a $3 billion environmental bond act. So within one year, we convinced the governor to announce this bond act. Um, and the, it, it was um, announced for environmental restoration and for flood resilience. He announced it at $3 billion, but our new governor just last week has raised it to $4 billion. So we just went up another billion last week. So um, finally, I just want to tell you about some of the things that we learned um, that I hope you can incorporate in your work and kind of your future of how to approach some of these issues. Um, the first one is that after a shock, everybody needs an outlet. Um, you're angry. You don't know what happened. You have a lot of questions. And staying home 
isn't going to help you. So creating the rebuild by design um, competition in that moment really helped kind of funnel that anger into progress. The next is I mentioned a few times today that interdisciplinary results come bring much, much better projects. Um, the next one is that there's distrust in government everywhere. Every single time I work with a new government, which is often, they all tell me how unique they are because nobody trusts government where they live. And it's, it's the same everywhere. It's the same in New York. It's the same in Europe. It's just the way it is. We need to figure out the ways that we break down this kind of narrative of distrust and start showing examples of building trust. Um, to work regionally, to make sure that you're taking a systems approach and not just solving the one problem that maybe somebody asked you to solve, but think about what are the all, all the other problems that touch on that and how do you create an approach that's going to really um, drive change to ensure that everything you're creating is replicable so the work that you do um, will live on in the future, that it's inclusive and collaborative. And I 100% believe that working with communities create a better project, that your project goes faster because they don't hold it up and they don't sue, and that it's a lot more fun and interesting. Um, that projects need to have be comprehensive to include a lot of benefits, which ultimately lowers the costs, and to stay the course. And this is where I'll end. Um, this was five years after Sandy um, asking if we we're even better prepared then. We get this question all the time from reporters. Um, but it's incredible um, how long these projects have taken. This was a an article that came out in New York Magazine before the Michael Kimmelman piece, which talked about, do we need to destroy a park in order to create a new park? Um, because we stayed around, because Rebuild by Design still existed, we were able to, at least for the first couple of months of the, well, let me go back. I don't know how much you guys have talked about it. So I'll just tell you what happened just in case you don't know. But essentially what happened is for the big U, the government started um, implementing the first section of it, which was called the Eastside Coastal Resilience Project. A majority of that section is in East River Park, which is a 57 acre park on the waterfront that abuts our lowest income housing um, right next to it. And for four and a half years, our government went forward um, with the same kind of idea that came out of, of Rebuild by Design. And then virtually overnight, they decided that instead of putting the berm on the backside of the park, they were going to destroy the whole park and lift the entire park um, eight to 10 feet. And they didn't do a good job of communicating why. Nobody believed them. All the trust that was built up in government for four and a half years complete, completely dissipated like overnight. And they had no renderings. They had no explanation of what it was going to be like. Any of the things that they had been working on for years, all of a sudden out the door. Um, but what was very interesting and probably the most interesting is, you know, we stepped in for many months afterwards to be there just to give information about what we knew about the old plan versus the new plan. We did not take sides. I feel very strongly that we don't take sides because, for instance, I don't live there. It's really up to the community to decide what they want. Um, but what was most interesting to me is that there is a group of people who came to our office to learn more about what happened during Rebuild by Design, um, the initial competition, because they weren't involved. And when we showed them the comp, when we showed them all the work that went into it and presented it, they did not second guess any of the decisions that were made um, originally because they felt like their neighbors were at the table and they wanted to back their neighbors up. So it's really important that you stay the course, that you're there to explain what's happening and that you get involved in these key moments. Um, unfortunately, what happened um, ultimately is that you read about um, in the Kimmelman article is that a group, a small group of people kind of broke off from the rest of the community. The, um, the local community board and all the local elected officials ended up supporting the new plan um, after they got more information, after studies were released. Um, however, a very, very vocal group of, um, of older, tend to be white um, uh, community members that don't live in the public housing have become extremely vocal about not wanting to lose their park. So it's become this like, unfortunately, it's become this battle of like, you know, who's more important, trees or people. If you want to learn more about our projects, please um, check out our, our website or download our book. And I'll stop here.
All right, thank you very much, Amy. That was uh, much more of an overview than I uh, thought, but you uh, packed a lot in and I'm uh, grateful for that. Um, I have to apologize, uh, midway through your uh, talk, I realized the Wake Forest students weren't on the call. <laughs> I don't know where they were, what, what uh, went wrong with them getting the link, but then we uh, contacted them and then they started uh, coming in. I think some were watching on, uh, on YouTube, but um, so they missed the first part of what you were saying. And I wonder if I could, before we switch um, to Edgar and then we'll have qu uh, questions from the students after, just ask you uh, to touch on one thing, to open up a little bit about one thing that you mentioned. You were talking about New York State as a whole or upstate, and you said it's a Democratic issue and it's a Republican issue. And one of the things that I think they took from last time was there's this divide, you know, you can't get around that. So in what way do you, do you bring people together politically on this? Well, I think that you just... It's so simple to show them a map, honestly. Like, nobody had understood the extent of flooding that was happening in New York state. And you don't necessarily have to bring them together in the same room, but what you're doing is you're inching them both along. You're talking to Republicans and you're talking to Democrats, the same way that you're talking to the city and you're talking to community members. They don't necessarily have to be in the same room. And a majority of what we did in Rebuild by Design was not put them in the same room, but put the designers in the middle and had them negotiate both sides and make sure that they were iterating and going back and forth and reporting. So I agree that it would be very hard to get Republicans and Democrats on the federal level to work on anything together. But I do think that there are ways to align the things that they care about in ways that um, will result in policies. Those policies may not end up on the front page of papers because it's not sexy. Um, but our government does plenty of work that we don't hear about. And I think that the way a lot of this um, will be successful is doing things somewhat quietly. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying not to be transparent because it should be hundred percent transparent, but doing it quietly where you're bringing people together little by little and little until you're grow, growing that support and then saying, Hey, look at us. We're done. We have a deal. Yeah. So in a sense, if you're keeping it off of Fox news and away from MSNBC, then, then maybe you can get, I mean, look what every, every single elected official cares about infrastructure. I don't care what Fox News says. Everybody cares about infrastructure. Nobody wants a, a bridge to collapse in their district. Um, but it became so polarized in the U.S. Yeah, great. All right, thank you very much for this. Um, let, let's switch to our next speaker. Uh, Edgar Westeroff is the National Director for Flood Risk and Resiliency in North America and the Associate Vice President at Arcadis USA. He, he, leads, uh, he led the Arcadis participation in the international HUD Rebuild by Design competition. Uh, he functions as the climate change adaptation specialist regarding integrated and multi-layered coastal waterfront and urban water management strategies. Edgar, you have the floor. Thank you, Russell. And let me start by sharing my screen here. I'm going to. Okay, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Good. Yeah, well, thanks for, for having me. Uh, Amy, I'm still um, thinking about your words, uh, uh, trees or people. Um, I guess that should have been one of the questions uh, we should have asked uh, the community years ago and see what kind of responses uh, we would have gotten. You're right. We probably could have um, headed off all of this yeah, drama. Yeah. We skipped that question. And it also makes me wonder if you were to, uh, to ask that question in the Netherlands, uh, people wouldn't even get the question because when it comes to water management, you know, it's always about the people and the trees will uh, hopefully come with it uh, but anyway uh, let's get uh, let's get to it um, uh, two topics basically in this in this presentation I'll be uh, introducing the Dutch uh, principles on coastal resilience very high level uh, I won't dwell on any of the uh, the strategies that you will see uh, each of them is worth uh, a presentation by itself because uh, we want to shift gear we want to talk about New York City uh, and the longer term planning uh, that has been going on for uh, the past decades uh, now, uh, and even a little bit, a uh, little bit longer, 
Uh, if there's prompting questions in between, uh, by all means, please uh, jump in. Something uh, is not- Okay, uh, Edgar, since you uh, uh, prompted about questions, that gives me an opportunity to say the, to the Wake Forest students who may not have heard me earlier, that we're expecting each student from Wake Forest or from Groningen to come up with a question for either you or Amy. And, and uh, Edgar just gave us the opportunity, whenever you want to pose a question, you can do it uh, either verbally or in the chat. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Well, um, you know, uh, Russell, uh, to your introduction, uh, you started with explaining the problem uh, of water. I think this image, even though it's quite old, a transect of the Netherlands, speaks to uh, the problem uh, of water. Uh, you know, the Dutch uh, uh, over centuries have learned to live uh, with these kind of challenges, but this definitely uh, makes it very clear what we are talking about. Water uh, coming from four ways. It's coming from the sea, coming from the western part of the country in the Netherlands, speaking about the Netherlands. Also, uh, groundwater issues, uh, riverine discharge, extreme precipitation. So how do you manage those? Uh, those four uh, resources in, yeah, in a landscape that is really challenging and has grown to a place where many people even question, like, why uh, did you start a country in a place uh, like that? You know, it used to be a swamp area. Uh, now cities like Rotterdam, Amsterdam, uh, the western part of the country evolved uh, out of that over the course of 100 years. Extremely complex to, uh, to regulate, extremely complex yeah, to craft a plan also looking forward. Um, so indeed the problem of water is very clearly explained through, through those, uh, those principles, those cross sections. Uh, the way that has been addressed uh, over a century is, uh, can be summarized, the coastal part of it at least, um, through yeah, a couple of strategies. Uh, I think the Delta works post uh, 1953, the big wake up call in the Netherlands, uh, which killed over 1800 people overnight, gave a tremendous response. The Delta Works has been accomplished uh, over 45 years, 15 billion euros uh, have been spent to that, took a long time. So talking about processes and uh, what Amy introduced in her presentation. Well, this is an example of you know, how much time is needed to get something done, even though there's a very strong political uh, commitment to act. Um, and you see a couple of, uh, of works here. Um, these works um, only cover like a small part of the Netherlands because 80% uh, of the coastal uh, zone is, uh, is a natural system, a natural dune uh, system. Also these dunes um, are close by uh, uh, beautiful municipalities. You see a couple of them uh, listed here. Uh, Arcadus projects uh, uh, where we have been uh, reinforcing uh, coastal uh, works, Noordwijk, uh, Honsbossen, Pettemus, Zeewering, Katwijk, Scheveningen. And I'll show you just an example uh, of what these uh, rehabilitation, but also reinforcement works uh, look like. And municipality of Katwijk, you know, talking about the problem of water, it's also a huge benefit, of course, uh, uh, a huge recreational benefit that uh, uh, is brought to these communities. Uh, lots of visitors uh, also from Germany traveling to this uh, beautiful uh, municipality, um, but that also caused a problem and traffic problems, parking problems, and the way that was handled. So we, we basically combined the challenge that we had in this location, um, or two challenges, three challenges. Uh, safety was uh, the, the, the driving factor, but also parking uh, was a huge uh, issue and how people experience uh, the coastal zone here. And the way that was done was uh, by uh, incorporating parking in this uh, rehabilitated uh, uh, levee landscape. Um, a parking integrated in the dune system. It gives parking space for over 500 cars. Uh, it actually generates revenue for the local community. So it's a combination, or sorry, an example of uh, a multi-purpose flood protection uh, work. And this is a coastal zone uh, that you just saw, but in the city of Rotterdam, uh, there's a whole yeah, different example, duck park or roof park, uh, which is combining different challenges. This used to be a challenge, uh, a challenge area, a challenge community. Um, and this intervention yeah, completely turned the area upside down, literally, uh, but in our opinion, in a very positive way. It now provides protection up to the, uh, to the required standards. 
uh, that standard is required by law in the Netherlands. So it's not uh, uh, an intention, say once in a 500 year or once in a 100 year, like in the US, and as you will see in New York, uh, this is up to once in a 10,000 year level uh, of safety. You know, talking about uh, multifunctionality, we see uh, how the park is being utilized and used uh, you know, for, for children to play. There's even a waterfall on top of this park while it protects flood protection. Um, building with nature is an important coastal uh, concept. This has been tested uh, over the past few decades. Uh, Arcadis is collaborating with uh, many stakeholders uh, in a building with nature a consortium called EcoShape. Uh, Arcadis is doing program management for a variety of, uh, of studies here. This is the, uh, the smaller, you can say, inland application of building with nature. And what we are doing is yeah, utilizing natural forces to let the water bottom uh, naturally grow. Uh, and the example you see here in the Marker Meer, just northeast of, uh, of Amsterdam, for the Dutch students, of course, uh, you all know where this is, but for the American students, uh, this is uh, also part of the fresh water supply for the city uh, of Amsterdam. This used to be a dead uh, a death bathtub, basically, Marker Meer. And Rijkswaterstaat, the Dutch Army Corps of, uh, of Engineers, the equivalent to the American organization, but then in the Netherlands, they've been using this lake as a, as a test pit, you can, you can say, for building with nature principles. Well, uh, it has changed completely. Uh, this, uh, the studies for this work started about 15 years ago, and it has evolved into a beautiful natural landscape, and it turned uh, the marker mirror uh, around uh, also here. Multifunctionality, but then more from an ecological uh, perspective. Uh, building of nature, not just an inland strategy, it's also a coastal, uh, an outer uh, layer of defense uh, 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 strategy. Uh, this is the sand engine just off the coast uh, of Scheveningen. Um, this is where the EcoShape Consortium uh, studied the larger scale uh, application of, uh, of building of nature using natural uh, um, a natural response through um, uh, sedimentation processes, uh, local currents, to let the land uh, and the beach grow naturally over time. Uh, this has been going on for almost a decade now, and it started really small, but it has grown uh, into a large body of, of sand. So the, 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 the beach area has expanded a lot, and that gives yeah, protection for, uh, for the municipality of, of Scheveningen. There used to be quite a bit of resistance when this program started. Um, resistance from uh, uh, local businesses, uh, you know, worrying, uh, about you know, uh, maybe safety aspects of what this would mean. Uh, quicksand, for example, well, uh, there is indeed uh, some risk uh, around this, but it has turned the area around in, in many ways. It's now a, uh, a kite surfing hotspot, actually in Europe. Uh, it attracts many, many people uh, because the circumstances are exceptional uh, in this area. Um, I'm shifting gear here now to, uh, to New York City. Um, this is where I'm based uh, myself. Uh, I've been in New York for, uh, for almost a decade uh, now, uh, and I've seen the transition in thinking, uh, which in large has been brought uh, by Rebuild by Design. And uh, I will speak to a couple of examples and uh, maybe uh, start with this, uh, this eye opener. Amy, you showed that collection of photos, Paul Sandy showing the devastation. And what struck me most, and I was just, uh, I was in New York City for only a couple of months uh, myself, you know, I had relocated uh, to the city. Um, and I biked through the city. Uh, the evening before Sandy hit, I biked uh, to Lowell and had my wife said, you know, what are you doing getting on your bike? You know, you need to stay home. No, I wanted to see it. I wanted to make photos of what was actually happening. How were businesses preparing? And that was just um, mind blowing because people had no idea uh, what was coming to them. Uh, and I've been talking about that uh, for a couple of years already. And now this was, I would say a disaster in the making. And we, we saw that response the following day. I went on my bike again, made photos again, and you know it showed the massive disruption. Everything below 23rd Street in Manhattan was without power. And you also saw the cascading impacts basically shutting down the city as a whole. Cascading impacts meaning you know, power generation, how all that is related to say critical assets like hospitals, telecommunications, uh, high rise offices, people couldn't commute into the city because the subway uh, didn't work. Also the tunnels were uh, inundated with water. 
So, you know, a disaster as a package and not just, you know, some individual issue. Uh, and that also, you know, triggered a response by the city, which was quite exceptional. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the, the response, the, the policy report that was generated in many ways is still the agenda that the city follows, uh, working the response post Sandy now a decade uh, after the event this year. Maybe to put this all yeah, a little bit in perspective, you know, we've probably heard about this uh, through previous introductions. What intrigues me, I'm not sure if you can see it all, but is that the climate change zones are changing. Um, and, you know, I put the dot on this uh, on this curve and you can check this actually uh, yourself. Uh, you can find these uh, tools online, but it shows how New York City, how the climate is changing. And by the year uh, 2100, New York City could have the climate of uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And for the Groningen students, uh, that means, you know, just imagine if uh, Groningen would have the Barcelona climate, you know, 2,000 miles, sorry, 2,000 kilometers away. That's how climate zones uh, are creeping up uh, on us and changing weather patterns uh, in, a, in a tremendous way. So how do we respond to that is the, um, well, for us as, as engineers, is the multi-billion dollar question. Uh, this is summarized in this like, you know, why is this important? Um, you know, we don't have the money, we don't have the means to uh, to respond to it uh, in the US at least. You know, the US, uh, the national deficit is, is huge. Many cities are bankrupt. So how can we avoid this from happening? Uh, again, you know, this is some 2020 and before uh, numbers, Hurricane Sandy, uh, close to 60 billion uh, in economic losses. Katrina, still the record uh, of over, uh, with Harvey, over 250 billion. Uh, I think 2021 is uh, is currently at 175 billion uh, in economic insured loss with Hurricane Ida uh, topping the chart of uh, around 65 billion. So it's uh, it's not a, you know a matter of will it happen this year 2022. It will happen this year. It's kind of Russian roulette. We don't know where it will happen, uh, but we do know it will be costly, and we do know that you know it will trigger a lot of devastation. Um, I'm go going back and bringing it back to uh, to New York City. Um, the first company that reached out to Arcadis, and I'm also showing a little bit the private sector perspective here, was Verizon, a large telecommunication uh, provider in the US, uh, headquartered, at least their real estate branch, headquartered in Germany, that reached out to the Dutch government. Uh, we need a response. We need a plan for our telecommunications uh, centers in law and Manhattan. This one is just... Uh, north of One World Trade Center, beautiful landmark building, 140 West uh, Street. Uh, you may have seen this uh, yourself, uh, one block north uh, of the former Twin Towers. When the Twin Towers collapsed, um, they brought their critical equipment to their basement because that is what was recommended to them as a response uh, of, that, uh, of that attack. And it shows how, you know, we tend to respond to previous events, events from the past. Because bringing all that uh, critical equipment into their basements uh, following uh, following Sandy uh, showed that that was not uh, the best uh, the best response because their basements got completely inundated five floors down over 100 feet of below ground space completely inundated with seawater which knocked out uh, telecommunication and internet services in Lower Manhattan. So first you know you can say uh, following the Twin Tower collapse there was a multi billion dollar response to bring it into their basements. Following Sandy, there was a reverse uh, response, uh, a multi-billion dollar response to bring that critical equipment back to uh, higher floors. The solution we provided was through a removable flood plank uh, strategy, not ideal. It took uh, a 16 people crew uh, over three days to deploy uh, this strategy. Um, if we were to do this again, uh, we would likely not have chosen this uh, this solution, but it was available uh, as, a, as a strategy back in 2012. Uh, another uh, strategy that I'm explaining here is uh, about protecting uh, tunnel infrastructure. This is the uh, Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, uh, one of the main uh, infrastructure hubs between Manhattan, between the city and Brooklyn. Uh, we protected that through a design-built solution with massive floodgates, marine-style gates that can be closed just prior uh, to a storm event. Also, this tunnel completely inundated uh, during Sandy, uh, causing uh, a lot of disruption for many weeks. 
um, this shows the complexity Edgar, of- Edgar, yeah. can I interrupt? Absolutely. Um, I'm interrupting because you asked for interruptions and to Absolutely. tell other people that they can pose questions uh, interrupting you. Um, those, the floodgates over the tunnel, they still exist? They still exist. They're beautiful tunnels. Yep. Um, beautiful uh, gates. But, yeah, beautiful gates. Um, sometimes there are some concrete barriers sitting right in front of them, which makes you wonder, okay, if we were to close, uh, have to close these like tomorrow, uh, is the city or is the, uh, uh, the, the authority responsible for it, ready to do so? Um, that is a good question. These solutions do come with operation and maintenance uh, uh, plans. And uh, it speaks a little bit to the cross-section, uh, Russell, that you see here, because a tunnel is almost like a city if you start to peel off you know, the different systems that uh, requires protection. So in a way, it's kind of a systems approach that we took uh, for this, uh, this, this asset. Um, quite complex. Um, it's, it speaks at a larger scale to yeah, the vulnerability of, of New York City. We also hosted, for example, city of Boston, uh, which has a lot of these, uh, these tunnels to New York. We explained them what we did. And I do see it as a short-term strategy for that city as well. Uh, but in the long term, this is a questionable uh, approach as well. And I'm getting there uh, with you know, the longer term planning uh, that we as Arcadas have been involved in. And that started uh, uh, as, part, as part of the, <laughs> the post-Sandy response uh, initiated by people like, uh, like Dan Cerilli uh, out of uh, the mayor's office, uh, Office of Recovery and Resilience. Uh, which was the Southern Manhattan multi-purpose levy. This was uh, Bloomberg's response uh, starting in 2013. Um, it was a, in a way, you know, we tried to replicate what had happened with Battery Park City. You know, Battery Park City, you saw the image uh, right after Sandy, all the lights were out except for Battery Park City. So in a way, you know, that, that was a showcase of, you know, of resilience. Um, and through this study, we, you know, we, we try to replicate that through land reclamation in the East River. And there was quite a bit of emphasis in the strategy that we post here on development. You know, this was the Bloomberg era, uh, a different political um, perspective uh, back then, uh, 10 years ago now almost. Uh, but it showed that this was a feasible uh, approach. So the objectives of the study, not just to show how can this pay for itself through development, uh, but also how can we bring added value to this, uh, to this area. Uh, also the regulatory uh, complexities were studied uh, to great detail. Um, so we now have also for the following study that I will show further down in this presentation, uh, have a good understanding of you know, what this means if you were to go this route, uh, working with, uh, with the water to provide protection. I'm showing a couple of cross sections from over eight years ago. So you see the build out strategies that we have studied. You know, this is the maximum build out over 500 feet, maximum fill, a lot of development. Um, and I think an important piece to this was also to understand the, uh, the data, you know, what are the implications if you are to do this? And uh, the outcome of that exercise was that, you know, for example, the velocity of the uh, East River, uh, the water speeds uh, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, did not really uh, was not really impacted as a result of uh, a development like this. But more uh, further down in this uh, in this presentation, um, I think a big part of what we try to communicate, um, even you know, ten years now post Sandy, is you know how is sea level rise going to impact. Uh, you as, as a community. And these are yeah, some, some numbers uh, we have worked for Lower Manhattan. And you see uh, how water is creeping up. And I think a first very important uh, yeah, threshold, literally threshold, is the waterfront edge uh, and how by 2050 water will be creeping over that edge uh, at a daily basis. So in 20 years, 20 to 30 years from now, the daily high tide will exceed the waterfront edge, and you will see how uh, it get uh, uh, worse over time. You know, by 2100, five to six feet, uh, and uh, regular inundation, inundation uh, at that time. So I'm I'm shifting gear now, also uh, talking uh, about a couple of the concepts that that Amy has uh, mentioned. So after our initial you know studies 
uh, working on these uh, these tunnels, working for Verizon, telecommunication hospitals, you know, the critical assets. Um, rebuild by design came and maybe i can i can share a few uh, experiences uh, as a company you know stepping into that into that process because for arcadas this was all new uh, we were not used to respond to competitions and within arcadas uh, i remember the discussion we've had uh, we had with a couple of people saying you know this is like an architect kind of thing you know we don't do this we respond to requests for proposals rfps and you know we, we are used to position and now we had no idea what was coming our way but you know there was this guy from the netherlands hank oving we had not really heard about him but he told uh, us you know this is important you need to be part of this um, and he convinced us to to participate uh, in this uh, in this competition, which started uh, really humble for for us. We had a discussion uh, starting with uh, West Eight, Adrian Geuste, a visionary architect from the Netherlands. He made some really big works in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, really thinking long term, and he reached out to us. And I had a first meeting with him in New York City. And he told me, like, Edgar, you know, you need to wipe everything off the table that you are used to as a company because we, we want to do something uh, uh, completely new. And he explained the concept of the, uh, the offshore constructed landscapes uh, to me. We are going to utilize the Atlantic Ocean to provide protection for New York City. And uh, that was a fantastic lecture. We, we talked for over four hours and I left that room completely uh, mind blown away. <laughs> like, geez, this is, uh, this is something special. Uh, even though I couldn't really understand the, you know, also the commercial value in participating, it was clear that uh, he was into and up to something that had, you know, really far reaching implications for a city. Uh, like New York. Um, so we went along with West 8. We started working on those offshore constructed landscape and also other teams started to reach out. And we joined the uh, Bjarke Ingels team also with Matthijs Pau, one architecture. And we joined yeah, many sessions. And I borrowed this slide from you, Amy, uh, tweaked it a little bit to, you know, to explain um, what was not known to us, to Arcadus, um, before we joined Rebuild by Design, which that taught us what the value of a process brings. Because we as a company were, uh, were used to, you know, to solve problems. You know, this is your, your challenge and this is the outcome. And we would engineer our uh, way out of that, you know, a straight line from A to B. But uh, what Hank Oving and what Rebuild by Design and Amy and her team brought to us was, yeah, much more of, you know, that you know, what we could call like an iterative planning process. But uh, I believe Hank also called it like a sabbatical detour. Let's sit back with each other. What are we trying to accomplish? You know, working from that, that abstract ambition, you know, on the left, where I have like that number one, to yeah, that that process, that cycle that you go through, and what is the outcome? What are the obstacles to get to that outcome? And when you start to peel off that challenge, um, yeah, you can you can work your way in a much yeah better scheduled and planned way uh, addressing uh, many of the challenges. Who owns those challenges? bring them back together in a much more comprehensive way where you can you know, start to understand value. And a lot of those meetings uh, where we try to understand those values, and I think we had over 100, 150 meetings or so uh, in five years. Uh, I attended many uh, of them myself. Um, you know, we have learned a lot and it changed the way we as Arcadas are doing business currently because this model has been replicated uh, as Amy explained, all over the world, but also in the US. Because Rebuild by Design was not a standalone New York City thing. It has been replicated uh, following the National Disaster Resilience Competition. Many other proposals followed uh, New York's lead uh, in, uh, in more than one uh, way. So learning to understand the process has been vital uh, to us. Um, you saw a slide on this, and I'm, I'm glad, Amy, you touched on yeah, on the activism, I'm not going to uh, to speak too much about it. I'm observing this uh, myself uh, closely. I think it's a little bit for us as planners, as engineers, a missed opportunity because these voices were out there uh, back in the days as well. So for us, it's really have we done our homework uh, well enough uh, to capture, you know, 
people's uh, response currently tying themselves to trees. And, you know, uh, to your question, like trees or people, um, it's not trees or people, it's trees and people. And how can we bring both values together through our planning work is really the question uh, we should have asked ourselves a little bit earlier, probably uh, in the process. Still, you know, it also is a showcase of how um, the discussions are constantly changing. You know, it's, there's a new set of actors all the time. So it's not like, you know, and back to that spinning wheel, that iterative process that you can pause and uh, sit back and relax and think, you know, I've done my work. No, we constantly have to be uh, on top uh, of what we are doing also as, uh, as planners, as engineers. Edgar, uh, in can I space. jump in for a sec? Absolutely. Can I, on the last slide? Um, and I hope we have more time to talk about it later. But I think I think what's, what I, what I hope doesn't, I don't think we want to leave the students with thinking that the people were opposing the project. The last project or the last iteration of the project would have taken down trees too. Um, they, the community is very angry about the process by which the city was being extremely collaborative for four and a half years and then changed their minds. And I think of the trees as a tool. That is the thing that they eventually kind of realized could work after going through many, many other iterations of trying to figure out other ways to get to the city. So um, I don't like I, I don't think it's a reflection on Arcadis of, about what you did or couldn't have predicted in the future. I really think it's 100 percent a reflection on the city and a very important lesson that they learned and admit that they learned that all they really need to do is have one or two meetings with the community and say, hey, we're running into some technical issues that we want to explore with you. Maybe there's a way out of it. Maybe there's a way to change this up and, and do something that will be even better. Um, and they didn't. And they had many, many missteps in a row until they started kind of like picking it up and then it was too late. Um, but there, this, um, the group of people who are doing this have gotten a lot of attention by, you know, I mean, look, you're giving them attention now. Um, mm -hmm. You've gotten a lot of attention uh, by chaining themselves to trees. So they're continuing to do this. And I think everyone probably also knows on this, on this that Edgar and I also care about trees. Absolutely. We love the trees. <laughs> They're beautiful trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, the, the following slide kind of put a couple of things in perspective. And, you know, uh, the value of nature is one of them uh, because you can monetize value. And uh, so I think in a way, and, and you can find actually the, this report online, it's a 150 page document where we explain the mechanics uh, of the Eastside Coastal Resilience uh, Project, but then through an economic lens. Um, and it speaks in great detail about the cost benefit. So this is an important tool. This was also brought to us, these kind of economic analysis through Rebuild by Design. Uh, we never really used to integrate these kind of economic analysis in our planning work. You know? So I think we've learned a great deal uh, about this. Another misstep was that the government um, did not release any of the studies that they had claimed to do at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and they and the community, what is called FOIA, so Freedom of Information Law, Freedom of Information Act, you know, requested them many, many times. When they did get them, it was redacted. There was a lot of, you know, um, non-transparency that mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Well, I think it's also fair to state that uh, activists uh, uh, sometimes take big steps uh, when it comes to uh, you know, fighting for their course. Uh, and I think this is an example because there's a lot of thinking again into, um, uh, into protecting uh, New York City. So a lot of numbers were generated, but you know, it, in all fairness, um, we have learned, we are learning. Uh, and please also take a moment to take in that disclaimer, you know, projects may benefit the few at the expense of many. Uh, this is where, for example, uh, uh, climate equity comes in. We were not used to those kind of words uh, post Sandy. We were not used to these societal um, uh, 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 forces. And it has changed the way we are doing our business. And I think we, we, I, I want to pause it here and, and Russell, maybe in the Q&A, we can talk about this uh, a little bit more, but I would welcome uh, the audience here, the students to take to Google uh, this document actually. So you can actually see how uh, the breakdown uh, of this project uh, uh, and what that looks like. Um, uh, I'm shifting gear here now to, uh, to the financial district because a lot of the lessons learned 
from Lower East Side, from East Side Coastal Resilience, which is the big, big first study where we went through the entire process from A to Z, um, which is you know, starting to see construction, not uh, unimportant, because as soon as the shovel goes into, into the ground, as we currently see, you know, that brings a whole new dynamic. Um, so with financial district, we, um, you know, we are basically uh, back at square one, even though we have done that study back in 2013, uh, we've showed that this study was feasible. Um, it's still a, a tremendous challenge. And I, I'll take a little bit of a, a deep dive there because this is uh, what the landscape currently uh, looks like. Uh, Arcade has made plans for all these uh, high rise offices uh, that you see here, one New York Plaza, uh, just to call out one example. It's the, uh, the building you see right here. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, it's uh, in the middle. Uh, that building alone had over 80 million, 80 million uh, in economic loss uh, as a result of, uh, of their inundation. Uh, tenants who couldn't come back uh, to, this, uh, to this office building for many, many months. Power came through, um, through trucks that were parked on the street, uh, no telecommunication, no internet. So it, you know, it shows how vulnerable uh, Lower Manhattan is, especially at this location, because Sandy squeezed the water into the New York Harbor, and we saw wave uh, activity over eight feet uh, in this this part of uh, in this part of town. And that speaks to the solution strategies uh, that we need to come up with. And I'm showing this image uh, to put the following images uh, in perspective. This is the current landscape. This is the view south from Wall Street. Uh, you also see uh, the FDR Drive. You know, in many ways. Uh, a bit of a relic from the past, and we need to incorporate that into a plan that is as yeah, forward thinking as it possibly can be. So it, you know, say in, in two, three decades from now, it's still a no regret that allows for adaptation. Uh, and we are really trying to capture those values. And those values in, yeah, in many ways are, are explained through this slide, because what are we trying to accomplish? You know, first by acknowledging the relevance uh, of this area. The relevance explained in economic benefit, and also the relevance in value where it's currently lacking, because there's a great opportunity to have to bring other amenities to this location where we currently don't have it. You know, you see some kind, somewhat of an open landscape here, but it's also a bit of a hodgepodge, a mess uh, of you know what has cre been created uh, over many decades. So it's an opportunity, you know, water as a challenge, water also as an opportunity and a business case uh, to, uh, to do a better job uh, when it comes to uh, our response. Um, within our cadres, within the company, within our team, uh, we also look a little bit about this study, uh, the financial district master plan as the second phase uh, of the big U, first phase, or east side, east side coastal resilience. This project um, uh, is uh, building on that work. So it's uh, everything south of the Brooklyn Bridge and then it ties into, uh, into Battery Park and it ties also into, uh, into higher ground. Higher ground, uh, talking about challenges for New York. Uh, Manhattan has, well, let's look at it from the positive uh, side here, uh, level. Uh, it's not just uh, a problem. There is higher ground in, uh, in Manhattan, I think uh, over time. Uh, we will see uh, a greater appreciation of that uh, higher ground. Uh, it's basically everything west uh, of Water Street, uh, where elevations go up um, uh, quite rapidly. So that means over time we, we may be able to work uh, with that in other parts of town. But that's not the direction we are uh, choosing here for financial district. We do work with these, uh, these lines and we do work with the graphic uh, that I've showed uh, before uh, showing the sea level rise uh, numbers. Um, so the response, um, you know, it needs to be holistic. It's about values, very much so, not just about pr providing protection. Um, it's also about providing uh, future amenities, trying to be as forward thinking uh, as we can be. So how will people move around, for example? Do we still need the FDR in two or three decades from now? Um, what does the solution that we come up me, uh, come up with mean for, you know, say, the existing drainage system? Uh, are we creating bigger problems uh, as a result of a protective alignment uh, that will build on uh, that first phase, the lower east side? So a lot of questions that we are going through as a team. Um, this is also touching on, you know, the rebuild by design. 
as uh, lesson learned for Arcadis, we are working with a large team. One architecture is, uh, is one of them, but there's many more. I think we have over 10 uh, subs uh, on this project, uh, all specialty subs, so everyone is uh, contributing in their own uh, discipline. Uh, it's quite a smooth team. We presented the final results a couple of weeks ago. So for everyone on this uh, call, uh, please uh, go online and, uh, and Google uh, financial district master plan and you will see some uh, really cool visuals. Also the reporting uh, can be found uh, online. I'm just showing a couple of examples here, uh, which also shows and put the previous um, plan uh, a little bit into perspective. So it's still about um, using and utilizing the East River, but we are more playful with the circumstances that uh, that we find in the East River. So it's not about, you know, are we going to build out 100 feet, 200 feet, 500 feet? How will it be developed? Development is really uh, not the objective uh, of this plan anymore. The solution is much more of a hybrid plan. That means, you know, the, the, the protective alignment is more of a combination of strategies. And the next slide is going to speak about that a little bit more. Um, I think this one, you know, this is one of the initial uh, 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 images that we've created. Uh, Amy, and you show that big wall. Uh, well, this is of course not what uh, this wants to be. Uh, it may be like a quick uh, and dirty approach, but of course the biggest amenity for New York will always be its water. So this is not uh, the approach you want to take here. Um, uh, an evolution to that, you can say as well, uh, let's see what space we have and how we can utilize that space in a more optimal way uh, by creating open spaces, um, still with walls, but maybe certain sections that we have to close off during an extreme weather event. Um, that's, we found less feasible for Lower Manhattan. It will be applied uh, in the Lower East Side, will be uh, over 15 uh, gates that can be closed, also in passing the FDR, but this is not really a coastal uh, uh, strategy uh, because the dynamics, mostly because of the dynamics uh, in this area, there's a lot of wave activity and these solution strategies are simply not designed to, uh, to withstand uh, that kind of, those kind of dynamics. Uh, so we may see um, uh, an active case here and there, but the solution for financial district is much more about creating a passive uh, solution that is uh, permanently uh, in place. And that is uh, what you're seeing here. Uh, a passive solution uh, means uh, utilizing uh, the space we have in places and where we don't have that space, uh, we are looking at the East River to, you know, to find that space and bring in that elevation and bring in uh, a more dynamic, a more dynamic landscape. This is a different kind of cross section. So it shows also the different uh, functionalities, you know, transportation corridor still with the FDR, um, but then there's a transition zone with higher ground that is providing the actual protection, uh, 16 feet uh, up uh, from the existing uh, elevation, which sits around uh, eight feet. So I think the elevation we find here uh, will vary between 10 and 14 feet. So it's still quite, uh, quite substantial. This is what um, the artist impression looks like. This is with the FDR in place. This is without the FDR. So we are studying uh, the implications of not having an FDR drive uh, here explicitly. This is also without the FDR drive and uh, utilizing that existing, uh, that existing space. And I think I'm coming to the end of my presentation. And I don't want to, because we've been talking about cities a lot, a lot of attention to cities. When I give uh, city presentations in, uh, for other audience, there's always a question, but what about the rest? And I think we don't want to forget about the rest. This is, uh, this is not New York City, actually. This is New Jersey. This is the Back Bay. Um, but it speaks to, you know, the challenges at large for, I would say, the New York City metro area. This could also be Jamaica Bay. This could be uh, the Long Island Sound. And there's many municipalities out there that are just sitting two or three feet currently uh, above high tide, maybe a little bit more. But by 2050, you know, sea level wise, not going to make a distinction for these areas that are only 50 miles away from New York City. So these communities will also uh, need to think about their future. And I think a big strategy we will see, uh, where we will see a lot of development is about uh, retreat. 
uh, sometimes called managed retreat, but there will be active policy making. It's currently happening already, but it's more like a silenced effort within the city to study the implications and also get the city itself ready for, yeah, for these kind of discussions because these communities uh, will likely not uh, yeah, sustain in the, next, uh, in the next 100 years. And that means a transition away from the coast, a transition to higher ground, a transition that will be facilitated through zoning, um, and hopefully a transition that will not be facilitated um, through economic processes. And that is uh, maybe a little bit of the quick and dirty uh, 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 Russell American approach <laughs> that you are probably more familiar with uh, than I am, but uh, maybe that's also something we can discuss uh, a little bit more during uh, our questions. Thank you, very like much, to, uh, Thank you for um, g nominating me as the quick and dirty person. Um, <laughs> uh, you, you've got several questions coming up now in the chat from the students. Uh, one is, do you think the pandemic has accelerated or delayed these initiatives? Um, I'm also curious about Amy's response, but for, for us, I mean, we see a new appreciation of open space, open space planning. Um, so we no longer take open space for granted. And just you know, from a personal perspective, I've been surprised twice. I've been surprised uh, following Hurricane Sandy, and I've been surprised biking through Central Park and seeing emergency hospitals. Uh, I would not have um, yeah, ex expected anything like that to happen in my lifetime before I, you know, I moved to New York. And so I think it it it, it tells us, you know, are we preparing for? Um, or what are we actually preparing for? And uh, I think valuing open space um, is something that we really need to take in in a much broader uh, uh, play. And I'm glad that this slide is still up. I think I'm sharing my screen still. So how are we going to, to, you know, to use this space in the future? It's not that we are going to give it up. We are going to repurpose this landscape. Um, and that should be part of, uh, part of the discussion part of the way we explain this. You know, it's about repurposing uh, in ways. Uh, thank you for that. The next question, last week, Hank Oving talked to us about the importance of blending form and function in water management initiatives. What are some of the issues you have run into, if any, and this is for you or Amy, um, from an engineering perspective in trying to accomplish this? Well, Form and, and, and function. I mean, to us, that is, uh, you can say, you know, form follows function. Um, this is how we have, you know, we, we, we oftentimes talk about the business case for resilience. So why are we doing this? What value can we bring to our solution strategies? And if uh, resilience is done right, then the spin-off um, is multifaceted. It's not just economic, it's also societal. Um, and I think that is for, for us, uh, for, for us as, an, as planners, as engineers, um, the proof of success at the end of the day. And you know, that's why I also started the presentation with examples from the Netherlands, because that's where we have turned challenges into opportunities and it shows that it can work. Um, but it only shows you know, certain parts where it can work because we also need to be realistic where it will not work because the story around these, you know, these beautiful parks and uh, parking integrated in, in levees, etc. That's not going to be the solution uh, all, all around. So we have to give ourselves that, that reality check as well. And in more remote coastal places, you know, that question, that very question will be answered in different ways. I just want to also add that form and function has existed in industrial design for, you know, ever. Our teapots have become easier to use, our forks, you know, everything, that, the chair that I'm sitting in, right? So I think that the, I think that it's the articulation of form and function up front of, and um, having our government agencies um, be responsible for caring about the form in addition to their function. Yeah, that's a good, a good point as well. Um, this is uh, kind of a long question. How does the cost effectiveness of rebuild by design planning scheme compared to other compared to other conventional infrastructure projects? 
it seems that the budgets will increase by applying rebuild by design concept because it involves many people and institutions and does rebuild by design and can it be applied in low and middle income countries with very limited budgets? That's obviously for you, Amy. Um, that's a lot of questions uh, <laughs> <laughs> altogether. Um, just taking them backwards, uh, check out water as leverage. I'm sure Hank must have mentioned it last week. Um, talking about low income areas that have taken a somewhat similar to rebuild by design approach, but every place where we go, and I wasn't part of Waters Leverage, but Hank was, and I don't know if you were Edgar, but every place that you go, you have to change to adapt to that place. So whether we're in Mexico or, you know, Boulder, Colorado, we're creating a process that's going to work there and figuring out what the stakeholders need there and how their how their governments function. Um, in terms of the cost effectiveness, I think Rebuild by Design was super cost effective because we went from absolutely knowing nothing to having 10 incredible projects that, you know, dare I say, kind of changed the way that the U.S. will forevermore approach these um, challenges in nine months. Um, and we did it in a way that was um, educating the most amount of people that we possibly, you know, kind of touched upon. And you can decide to measure cost effectiveness in many ways. And we have a very flawed um, benefit cost analysis system in the U.S. And I'm very interested in, in talking to you after this, Edgar, about some of the work and your approach there, because that's something that Rebuild has been thinking a lot about over the past couple of years, is how do we change the benefit cost analysis systems or create them where they don't exist, because they don't exist in our city government mostly. Um, and do that to drive to, to drive the projects that we want to see. So if you kind of articulate up, up front that we are going to measure this project on ecological value, on social value, on health value, in addition to the value of what the actual project is, you're forcing city agencies to be more creative and to start thinking about form more often. Um, and you can say that that's more expensive or you can say that it's less expensive because now if you're driving down the cost of, of um, emergency hospitalizations because of asthma attacks, if you're driving down the cost of people dying earlier because of, of you know, cardiovascular disease because they don't work out, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you're actually then you're able to calculate it in a different way. And I would say that you're saving an enormous amount of money. Good. I'm going to put all the students who are asking, you're asking really good questions. I'm going to put you on the spot. There's no reason I have to read all these. Um, so uh, Hunter Shank, Jack Temple, all of you who are posting questions, uh, open up your mic and, and read your question. Yeah, um, as it pertains to, to building with nature, I was curious if you kind of expound on um, kind of the cost effectiveness of that. I know you said um, in the slide that it was cost effective despite its complexity. So um, a little bit of background into that, I suppose. And I, I, was, I was specifically curious if part of that kind of value assessment had to do with including um, kind of the ecological and social benefit that, that a plan like this might offer and how you go about quantifying it. Thank you. Yeah, maybe, uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we've talked about, about it, I believe, a bit already, but you know, um, even though there's a lot of thinking in in you know in that benefit cost analysis methodology, I you know the more and more we work with it, um, yes, numbers talk, and um, but numbers always show you what you don't know, um, and the more detail you try to bring into um, validating certain. Uh, Decisions, because in the end of the day, it's it's a decision making tool, uh, informed decision making, and informed decision making as a um, as a discipline, you can say, is is seeing rapid developments. But the economic piece to it, you know, it, maybe we, we come to a conclusion that it's not the right tool to use for 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 you know the planning work we have shown you in in our uh, presentations. Uh, because, you know, to, to my disclaimer, um, it doesn't always capture the value you, you want to see. At the end of the day, you know, uh, getting the shovel in the ground and trying to understand how communities will be happy with their solution in uh, one or two decades from now, making sure that, you know, what you've done is a no regret, um, uh, but a celebration. 
Um, that is the true value. And I'm pretty convinced in reading uh, these reports contributing to the planning itself that uh, just looking at a BCA number is the wrong path for us to, uh, to take. Um, even though it has become a pretty sophisticated task, path. And I think, you know, in the upcoming years, we will see for com through computer learning and you know, blending databases and creating new data sets that will inform planning in different ways um, that inform decision-making is, is taking a huge step forward. Um, currently, for example, we are practicing with digital twins. So turning uh, our urban environment into a digital landscape with a lot of data behind it. Um, and that will change the way we have our discussions. But we should not forget that, you know, uh, we, we are talking with people uh, in communities that have no idea to start with oftentimes. So you need to build trust. You need to take them with you with the stuff that you develop. And uh, again, speaking to metrics is uh, oftentimes not a successful path. I yeah, hope I just, that, that touches on <laughs> I know I want to jump in on this because I think that you you are you are raising a cautionary tale, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, however, we have a system in place now where we have government agencies that are single minded and they're only um, funded to, to work on what they do. So you can't mix transportation dollars with the water infrastructure dollars with parks dollars. It's incredibly hard. Maintenance issues are um, a hot potato. Nobody wants to pick up any of this flood infrastructure. So in New York City right now, and I'm sure it's in many other places, but I just happen to be familiar with the New York City case, there is no agency in charge of flooding. The Department of Environmental Protection, which delivers our water and is responsible for water going back into our waterways that is clean under the Clean Water Act, is only responsible for delivering water and for making sure that the water that hits the sewer system gets cleaned before it hits our waterways. Department of Transportation is not responsible for making sure that our streets do not flood. I can go on and on about this. And what happens is that nobody's responsible. And when nobody's responsible, not only do they not want their own dollars um, associated with building the infrastructure and the planning and having their staff work on that, but they don't want their maintenance dollars forevermore. So we have a parks department that is unwilling to create green solutions, um, unwilling to create green solutions on a large scale, I should say, because they don't have maintenance dollars. And it's a lot easier for them to use artificial turf because when it's artificial turf, they know it's gonna happen when it gets used a lot of time. But when it's green solution and it puddles, they, they can't fix it. So we have these major governance issues that, I feel like we have to come to a reckoning that the way that our governments are set up and are budgeted don't work for the problems that we now have to face. So cost benefit analysis may be a piece of it. <laughs> Gaia, Wahoo, uh, Ryan, Tracy, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. Oh, sorry. Um, kind of getting at the proactive versus retroactive planning. Um, and, and it's really for either Amy or Edgar. Um, do you think it will take other major natural disasters such as Hurricane Sandy uh, to spur further change and innovation in US water planning and infrastructure? Or can we make this shift to proactively planning around water management going forward? Thanks. I think the answer is yes. Every little natural disaster, or every big natural disaster that happens, we, we get a little bit further ahead. Um, New York City was inundated with water, um, record-breaking flood from flash floods in, I think it was September 1st, was Hurricane Ida. The week before, we had record-breaking flash floods um, from Hurricane Henry. And that woke up New York City to realize that flooding can happen in any neighborhood or in every neighborhood, which it did at that moment. Uh, there, you know, there are a lot of people running for political office at that time, in addition to a mayor that was leaving and was getting attacked for not having a you know, good comprehensive planning for many things that he did. And people started jumping on the fact that this is an issue. Um, I jumped right in, you know, into it and we used it as best yeah. as we can as an education yeah. moment because 
was it was very interesting how like reporters called me the next morning and said, oh, you know, is there any leftover sandy money? Can we take whatever is not used now and put it towards, you know, flooding and, you know, rain events? And I was like, no, we need the sandy money. And we need extra dollars and we need more to investment. So I think when the heat waves happen, when fires happen, it's horrible. And it's unfortunate that it comes along with death, but it also comes along with these crucial lessons learned that help us move forward. Well, maybe to add a couple of thoughts to that, also comparing the Netherlands, uh, the Dutch system a little bit to, you know, the governance system, a little bit to the American system. Uh, you know, I've been only in the US for, for a decade, so you know, please be gentle uh, with me. But what I have seen is that Americans don't have, I would say, a sixth sense for governance and improving governance and willingness to improve governance. And maybe, you know, talking about emergency, we, it's for a reason that we only have a FEMA you know, federal emergency management agency. And it's about that E, you know, it's about the emergency. But FEMA is, is only there to allocate funds after, you know, the fact, after an, uh, a disaster happened. And that has been the play for decades. And FEMA is, is well, first of all, it's bankrupt. It, it's, it doesn't have the means. It's a huge deficit right now. And even though they've learned a lot about emergency Again, that's again the word preparedness. Um, it is really about preparing up front, you know, spend that money now to avoid the much larger loss uh, that will be a result of doing nothing. So I think we are seeing that response. It's slowly changing. There is the political commitment, I think a bipartisan commitment on both sides to, to change this uh, display. Um, and there's many lessons learned, which is also why, you know, why Rebuild by Design with, with some of the uh, Dutch thinking, you know, preparing the way you work together is, is, is important. But even that, if you extrapolate that working together, there's also a, a, a downside to that, a pitfall. Because if you take a city like Amsterdam, which is so refined in the way it's being managed and operated, that... It has grown so complex that you could also argue and, and ask yourself the question, are we well prepared for, say, two meters of sea level rise in the Netherlands? Or do we need to rethink the way we are structured ourselves? You know, yes, we have a Delta Commission. Yes, we have water boards. We have water boards integrated uh, in city uh, governance. But is that the right way to, uh, to attack uh, the challenges from, uh, from 2050? Um, I'm not so sure about that either. So we need to learn on both sides of the Atlantic, I think is an important takeaway. The Dutch need to learn definitely also about community engagement, because that is like a blind spot uh, in the Netherlands. You know, the Dutch trust uh, their uh, professional organization because everyone's uncle and neighbor is, uh, is, is known with a, a water person, you know, or some planning person, fantastic. Uh, but we need to think bigger uh, in the Netherlands uh, as well. So maybe the Dutch should uh, uh, adopt some kind of a FEMA organization. What if there's a big emergency with our country, uh, whereas uh, uh, the US needs to adopt some of that water board uh, uh, thinking that we have uh, in, in the Netherlands. Other questions? Hi, um, I had a question for Amy. Um, so with Biden's recent like build back better like, infrastructure plan, how does that impact or like bring to unite the country in terms of um, more sustainable infrastructure across states? Oh, you know, it's interesting because with the idea of uniting the country, it also divided the country. It became this like hot button issue about whether or not we need it and how much do we need and how many dollars. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite unfortunate. And, you know, so I don't I don't think that it has united. Um, I do think that there is a lot of dollars that are going to exist that are going to help all different types of communities, whether they're rural or urban or suburban, um, use it for climate infrastructure, among other infrastructure. He's very clear that he cares about green. Um, that he cares about communities and that they want this these dollars to go um, 
in, in that direction. But remember that these dollars are going to go through regular government processes, regular RFPs from many different agencies, some of which will go through existing programs, some of which will be new programs. But the, And the innovation has to go all the way through. That's going to take a while for the governments to set up these programs where we'll have a sense, you know, if, if we're really going to be able to address it in the way that I, you know, truly believe that he intends it. Everybody who posted a question there, please read your question. Um, kind of building off of that, um, are there steps that you think like the American government could take to kind of encourage like sustainability efforts or like a stronger climate infrastructure, um, even with like the growing divide in the American political system? Yeah, I think that there's many steps um, and I think they've done some of it, um, but it's, it's very, they're very hard, you know, to make a statement, even to say, you know, we want to be carbon neutral by a certain day. When you do that at that very moment, everyone who is in business or have jobs related to anything that um, does not make us carbon neutral starts lobbying against it immediately, um, whether or not it's in their own personal interest. So it's, it's, it's extraordinarily hard. The way that I think that our government has to go about this is to actually show the path forward and show that there is a way to adjust transition, that there is a way to um, keep the companies that make a lot of money off of coal and, and you know, horrible things um, in business in ways that they can still make the same profits um, or the government has to be willing to live with it and basically say that they're going to take, you know, they're going to take this very, um, very conscious decision that maybe people won't like it, but they're going to go ahead and do it and have some courage. And courage is the last thing that our politicians usually have. Um, so I just had a question about if like the New York City project that you guys were talking about received any political challenges or opposition, especially looking at like the community, um, if the, there was like any challenges that they were posed with when proposing the project. No, actually, um, it was pretty universally supported at the beginning of it. The design team did this incredible job of looking back at all the different um, kind of thought pieces and plans that have come from both different government agencies and the community in that area, pulled out all the things that were really great about them, incorporated them first, and then added this extra layer of all the things that the community wanted. Not all the things that, the, that, that were designed at the end of the competition were going to get built. So for instance, the design teams um, thought very uh, kind of strategically about how to answer this call from the community members where they felt really disconnected from the park. So the design teams wanted to add additional br bridges and entranceways and essentially bring the park into the public housing um, development and, you know, give them an entrance to come in. Those extra, those extra bridges were cut out pretty much immediately. Um, and the design teams have done a lot in terms of making the bridges that are there look a lot better. Um, but it didn't have that same, you know, like we're going to bring the green infrastructure into your development um, approach. So things were cut out. I mean, one thing that I really loved about their um, plan, which wasn't the, or the government actually asked them not to put it in their final document, but I still gave out the images um, for years and years afterwards, was essentially thinking about using the FDR drive as the berm itself. So covering and capping that highway, ultimately when you have to build higher and higher, and then really bringing the park into, into the community. Um, there's been talk about getting rid of the FDR drive in the recent years, but back when we were talking about this eight years ago, no one was speaking about that. Maybe to add, yeah, a couple of first things. I mean, I agree it's in, with your observations. Uh, they, they also relate to, you know, the longer term planning that that is happening and has happened the past decades. I mean, I think in general, there has not been much discussion or political question about protecting critical assets. You know, I showed telecommunication, but there's also a large hospital uh, program, uh, which is not being questioned. They received 1.8 billion uh, in federal funding. So all these hospitals in the New York City region, which are 
all for some weird reason low lying, uh, close to the water. Uh, the rest massively impacted by uh, by flooding uh, during Sandy. Those programs are not being questioned, and I think the 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 post Sandy political response, the SIR report, special initiative for rebuild and resilience, which includes 275 strategies, you know, also talks about the larger systems that is keeping a city like New York going, transportation, healthcare, telecommunication, food supply, you know, how is New York City getting its food? Hunter's Point, uh, for example, I'm sorry, Hunts Point uh, in the Bronx. These proposals have not been questioned all that much because they really are like a backbone to you know what is driving uh, the city. So, of course, as soon as you you step into a community, you know that is someone's backyard, literally. So that requires a, a different um, uh, a re- process, which is uh, what rebuild brought in 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 many ways. Um, I would say you know the, the more business as usual, critical assets is. Um, from that regard, also a no-brainer uh, for other places, other cities, but other places in the U.S. as well. So, say power supply. You know, there's other uh, places around New York City um, that are that are providing value to the city. So, protecting those assets uh, is also a no-brainer because if you were to take those assets out, the economic loss uh, would be uh, massive. So, the play is usually, of course, bigger than. You know what, what we are doing in terms of planning at, at the waterfront. Um, we we're going to come to the end of the time here. I just wanted to pose Katarina's question uh, because it's a, it's a good one, and maybe she didn't want to talk, say it because it's about uh, her future. And I think a lot of these students are wondering. You're interested in her case. She has an economics background. Your whatever your background, you're interested in resilience as a future career. How do you how do you move in that direction? Call Arcadis, reach out, <laughs> send your resume. Call Rebuild, <laughs> no. Um, I think that you, I think there's gonna be so many, so many more opportunities for for these um, types of jobs in so many different disciplines than there ever is now and there ever was when we were kind of growing up in this field. This field is, is so um, nascent. You know, you think about the sustainability field and you think about how long it's been. So I worked in for Mayor Bloomberg and was part of the team that created Plan YC, which was this really ambitious um, plan um, back in 2005 and 2006 on sustainability. And that's a long time ago now. And we've come so long and people really understand carbon and there's businesses, every business has a sustainability officer. There's so much money and philanthropy that goes around for carbon, um, but that does not exist um, in adaptation and climate adaptation uh, yet. Um, I think it will at some point, it has to, we have to spend a lot of money in order to protect ourselves and the way in which we choose to do it's gonna be you know, kind of the critical piece of this puzzle. So keep at it, whatever you're doing, just get really good at what you do. And I'm sure you'll be able to apply, apply it. Um, that said, if you want to help us figure out a, a better cost benefit analysis approach that Edgar would also like, um, you're welcome to come volunteer your time with us. And, yeah, and Edgar took the step of putting his uh, email address there. Oh, huh? <laughs> so, so go right ahead. Uh, okay, so it's- Don't worry, Edgar will pay you. We won't. So maybe you should try him first. <laughs> Uh, we've reached the official end of uh, our time. Edgar and Amy, if you have a few extra minutes, the students may have to drop some of them anyway. Uh, but if anybody wants to pose their questions, either the questions in the chat uh, or other questions for the next couple of minutes, if you two can can stick around for a couple of minutes. Sure, I'll just, I mean, I can kind of answer a few of them that's come about. One of them was asking questions about my kind of flippant response about um, kind of secretly organizing policy. And I don't mean it so literally about like, we need to do what we can to keep our um, information out of the public realm. I just mean it in the way that um, we need to do what we can to ensure that the way that we talk about things are is, um, something that everybody wants. 
you know, that we are creating projects in ways that everybody can support, that we're making sure that we, regardless of, you know, how we vote, that we're looking at Republican and, and Democratic areas and incorporating their ideas into the projects, especially if we also, you know, care about it and doing it in a very thoughtful way. And I think if you do that, what happens is you just end up being kind of like lying low, not necessarily purposefully, but in practice, you end up lying low because you don't put yourself as a target. Um, also kind of asking that there are questions about working with communities and working with communities is absolutely a skill that is um, something that you get better at when you do it. It's not that easy, um, but the one advice I will give you is just to listen. Uh, majority of people come in, um, you know, they're the Department of Transportation. They came out of, you know, transportation planning school and they're really nervous because they're in front of a community and they think that they're the expert and they have to prove that they're an expert. But you're not an expert in where they live. They're an expert in where they live. They are the ones that can tell you what it's like to live there. I remember working on a project in Puerto Rico and we created a map. Um, uh, with Del Taris, actually, of another Dutch engineering firm about um, where it floods in this neighborhood. And the people looked at the map and they're like, no, it doesn't. That sewer was never built, you know? <laughs> so your information is only go as good as your data is. It's only good of what, th as what the reality is. So use community in the correct ways to make sure that the projects that you are creating are gonna be successful. Any uh, other? Yeah, thoughts? Amy, another uh, question here is uh, for you. It seems, uh, she said, it seems that um, the rebuild by design process would be, would increase budgets because you're involving so many people and institutions. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I kind of touched on that earlier. What we do is we create a time bound process so it doesn't go on for years and years and years. Um, so we created a process where the design teams got paid absolutely less than they're worth, no question about it. And the idea was that we would spark some really big ideas that can change the way that we approach projects. So in that way, it was successful. Now, not every single design team had success coming out of Rebuild by Design. Um, some of them didn't. A uh, few of them are quite angry, but the majority of them are really quite happy. And we created a five-year report that looked at the professional and um, personal uh, growth that came out of Rebuild by Design. And we were really floored to see how many people's practices have changed. I mean, even listening to Edgar, we haven't talked about this before, and he talked about how much Arcadis has changed since Rebuild by Design. So if you can think of it instead as um, an exploitation process, perhaps, and we're thinking about it as this is a moment where people come together for extra training, where you can get dis disciplines together in a um, short period of time, you can actually kind of excel forward pretty far. And that's the way that I think about it. Um, everything that we do is time bound. I don't think, I think there was like in the, in the Kimmelman article, there was, I think a Hunter professor that was talking about what we really need is time for consensus and you can never get consensus consensus um, without time. And first of all, I don't believe in consensus. There's winners and losers for every single project, you know, no matter what. And communities are used to having winners and losers. Like they understand that they can't get everything that they want, but they want to be listened to. And they understand that they also want their projects to be built as fast as possible. So they will respect the time bound process. Well, that's an important thing, Amy, you know, your, your last remark, you know, get things done. We need to get the shuffle in the ground because these metrics we are showing, um, there's, there's no delay possible, right? So also for, for, for you all as students, uh, when you go uh, and, and come work for an organization like Legal by Design or maybe Arcadis, you want to see your studies implemented. And um, we will see need to see a lot of studies implemented, shuffle in the ground, because that is the true proof uh, of this. And um, 10 years post Sandy, for those of you familiar with uh, New York City, uh, it's still quite hard to see what exactly has happened past decade, 10 years. Um, and some of them are quite turned down. So you need to use that window of opportunity. And that's just a couple of years after the disaster, two, three years, and the window of opportunity closes. That means after that, it will become more of a challenge. You know, we've seen that post uh, Katrina in New Orleans, uh, 2005. We've seen that in 1953. 
uh, we are seeing of Hurricane Ida, there's a, a, a shelf life to how long your window uh, is open. And you need to get your study ready within, that means shuffle ready within uh, that window of opportunity. That's just a couple of years. It cannot be eight years, uh, say for Eastside Coastal. We've been talking way too long. So yes, we do wanna uh, be very sensitive and, and capture all the values working with community members. At the same time, we cannot wait because waiting is not a choice between trees or people. It's, uh, uh, it's a choice between losing your community. Uh, life and move, death. Life and death, moving away, moving out of your city. That's what yeah. many of you will experience in your professional future. There will be failing cities. There will be failing cities all over the world. Maybe not because of water, maybe in Phoenix because of drought. Uh, we haven't really touched on that, but we will see failing cities and uh, we will need to learn from that really, really fast and get the shuffle in the ground. So we're also all learning, right? So Arcadis, um, like you mentioned before, uh, Edgar, that um, what you propose to do at the Verizon building after, right, after Sandy would not be what you would do now. So you're learning too. And when you have more clients, you, you don't have to go through that learning process anymore. You mm -hmm. jump over that and it comes to you quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you all for having yeah, thank us. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you both. Uh, that, and that was, I think, maybe my main takeaway, the extent to which you both are continuing to learn and your organizations are continuing to evolve through this. Um, thank you both very much for being here. Terry, do you have some any final remarks? Yeah, just uh, one final one in, a, in connection to what was just said, in connection to the last question in the chat. Uh, it's a paradigm shift, like Hank was saying last week. And it's not so much about uh, success directly, and it's not only about power or about money, but it's very subtle. So through the different way we speak about the problem and about cities and about how to approach it, it's infused in the communities that were on the table in New York. It's infused in the debates with students we have in this session. It's infused in the tilting paradigms within Arcadis and within other institutions. And it takes a long time, but it will corrode away the old ways of thinking about making cities safe. And it will gradually be replaced by something totally new. And we are witnessing the rise of a new doctrine about how to look at cities and resilience. And that's very hopeful. It's slow, but hopeful. And let's hope it's in time. And it's these students and all the other students around the world who's learning about this in school that are going to be the ones that are figuring this out. We'll be long gone. <laughs> <laughs> You're here. <laughs> all right. Thank you both very much again. Thanks to everyone for, uh, for taking part.